if you do weigh, um, let's say, the, the, the taste of milk, that's what you have on one side, and then the difference between like oat and oat milk and normal milk to the suffering of a cow. That's, those are on your two sides. What if the problem with reducing your animal intake is actually chronic health problems? And then what you have on one side is an increase in chronic health problems. And then that's suffering compared to the life of an animal. And well, then, chronic then, health problems, like th that's a different story, right? Welcome to episode 157 of my podcast. I'm Michaela Peterson. In this episode, I spoke with Alex O'Connor. Alex is the founder of the Cosmic Skeptic YouTube channel and an ethical vegan. He uses his channel to facilitate philosophical and ethical debates that range in topics, but often focus on animal rights advocacy and religion. Alex is a recent graduate of Oxford, where he studied philosophy and theology. The last time I saw Alex, the first time we met in person, was at the Beyond Meat debate at Oxford, where I spoke about why we shouldn't ban meat altogether. Alex was at the debate, and I like him quite a bit, so I'm glad we could finally speak. It was a fun episode. I don't agree with veganism. I think the way forward is through regenerative agriculture, but I think we covered some very interesting topics. And I think I'll have Alex back on to discuss religion as well. Let me know what you guys think. This episode of the podcast was brought to you by Gold Co., a leader in the precious metals industry. Inflation is at its highest rate since 1980, and I don't think anyone really knows how bad it's going to get. Our times are kind of unprecedented with a worldwide shutdown of the economy from COVID, which probably wasn't the brightest idea. We've diversified our family's portfolio to include precious metals, which have been shown to be a good hedge against inflation. I had Peter Schiff on my podcast in a previous episode that convinced me gold was a pretty stable idea. Gold Co. has helped thousands of Americans protect over a billion dollars in their retirement savings. Gold Co. is an easy place to start and has an A-plus Better Business Bureau rating. They're currently offering a promotion that's pretty crazy. It gives qualifying new customers up to $10,000 in free silver. Diversifying your portfolio is definitely a good idea at the moment. Visit mplikesgold.com and they'll give you up to $10,000 in free silver when you open a qualifying account. That's mplikesgold.com. Tell them that I sent you. Enjoy this episode. Alex O'Connor, welcome to my podcast. Michaela, it's good to see you again, if not in person, virtually. It's, it's uh, good to see that you're doing well. Thank you very much. I feel like this podcast has been a long time coming, so it should that be good. It, I've got it has. It has, yeah, a very long time. I think the last time we saw each other was at Oxford, right? Yes, it was. And I, I have a bit of a bone to pick with you about that, actually, because I remember not long after that event, um, which anybody who has seen or is familiar with, with the both of us might not know that I was there because uh, you were you, you were speaking and I was just kind of there as a, as a guest in my in my fancy black tie. And there was one particular speaker on uh, the other side to you who uh, it got kind of people were making a bit of a song and dance out of this out of this woman's speech. And I found it quite funny because I remember being in the room and I, I'm sure people will have seen this because I'm pretty sure you took the, the clip and put it on your own channel, right? Yeah, yeah, with some sort of inflammatory title. Yeah, and uh, I know your dad talked about it too, uh, quite quite a bit about this this crazed woman, this crazed feminist woman who is doing this ridiculous vegan speech. And uh, you know, I must say, it was a bit fanciful. I a remember bit fanciful. A and bit fanciful. I'm going <laughs> to insert a clip here, and then we're going to see what what people think about a bit fanciful. Yeah. I I guess I'm I'm trying to be diplomatic here because I did think it was hilarious because of. I was sort of sat on this on this front bench and I was directly opposite your dad. And I thought, uh, like, what, what, watching this speech is, is funny enough. Like, it was quite an entertaining thing to do. And I, but I thought of all the people to do this speech in front of, of all yeah, the people I know. on planet Earth, it was just hilarious. So I, I sort of seeing him just like, like, shriveling in his, just in like his chair. Just like cringe and pain. Yeah. But I know. so there was, was this, funny. so I remember sort of you and him both posting about it a lot. And, and I don't know, I, I wondered if you were sort of, posting about it as if to say, hey, look at this, this wokeness, or whether you were posting it to say, hey, look at this sort of veganism. I didn't know if it was more the, more the veganism part or more the woke part that you no, were sort no. of trying it, to, to warn of. 100% more the woke part. However, I do think that there is an overlap. Now, I don't think you embody that overlap. 
Um, but I do think that there is an overlap, especially with people who are really interested in like uh, protecting the climate, veganism, like wokeism. I think there's an overlap. But what I was trying to portray with her video was was the woke part for sure. I think most of her like most of the language she used had more to do with that than veganism. Yeah, yeah. I, it's actually one of the, the the main things that I that I try to uh, promote whenever I'm talking about veganism or just the ethics of animal suffering more broadly is to try and separate it from uh, I want to say political connotations but that's a little bit too broad but there's this idea that to be a vegan you have to uh, take up yoga and wear loose clothing and grow out your hair and this kind of thing um, I, I think we need more vegans who wear suits we need more vegans who uh, are sort of culturally on the right um, not not because I think it's good to be culturally on the right, but just because I think it's important to separate the issue of animal exploitation as being bad from being a kind of fringe woke phenomenon, which is what at least veganism yeah. certainly is uh, at, at the moment, uh, which is why I'm, I'm, I'm glad that you're willing to, to have me on to talk about this, because I know that the perception of veganism is pretty negative. I mean, the biggest problem that the vegan community faces is probably a PR problem. Um, and I guess I'm just trying to contribute to removing that problem. Um, it's it's quite difficult to know why exactly it is that it's connected in that way. I think it's got something to do with the fact that people on the left and people who are part of the this this woke phenomenon are, are certainly um, more inclined to be in favor of radical revolutionary thought. It's something that it sort of gives them something to fight about, and this is what a lot of it's a lot of it's about. And of course, veganism is, is a wonderful example of, of, of this because you have this huge problem of animal exploitation in factory farms that, that definitely needs solving. And so it makes sense to me that this would this would be like, you know, music to the ears of people who are wanting a social issue to, to fight strongly for. But I, I resent to see that it's often reduced to that, that this sort of it's intrinsically connected to this this wokeness which wokeness itself has become a bit of a meme it's not even clear exactly what it what it means um but i guess i'm trying to sort of move the perception away from that and say that no what veganism really is about at least ethical veganism or the kind of veganism that i would promote is the rather simple proposition that if we can avoid inflicting unnecessary suffering then we should do so that's what it breaks down to for me so you know thanks for having me on to talk about it i do appreciate it yeah no problem at all um I think I think part of the issue is a lot of people who are pushing veganism from what I've seen, like the the people with the viral videos online, I don't know if they're interested in veganism to reduce animal suffering or to make themselves appear as if they're doing something virtuous. Right? Like that's the main goal of their veganism. So I think what you're doing it, it puts you in a different camp than what a lot of people are doing. And I think that's maybe where the overlap with wokeness is, which is there are some, I, w I wouldn't even call them woke, but there are some people, a lot of people on the left that are actually interested in equality and reducing suffering, really. Uh, and then there are people who are just interested in it so that they appear virtuous. Yeah. Uh, but then, of course, that's a problem with any ethical issue. Uh, it, it can be difficult to separate those people who are doing it for the, for the sake of really caring and, and those who don't. But equally, because you know, if, if you do something long enough, um, especially if you make it sort of your job, so for, for a, quite a while, advocating for veganism and making noise about animal suffering was essentially all I was doing all the time, talking on podcasts, giving talks, this kind of thing. And it gets to a point where you're, you're sort of talking very emotively about the suffering of animals, but you've, you're talking about it so, so, so much that it's almost like you don't really feel it anymore. And so, you know, I, I like to sort of take breaks and make sure that I'm, I'm constantly rethinking what I'm saying and not, not being, I guess, dogmatic about it. Um, but I think, you know, sometimes you might see people who look as though they're just doing it for the sake of it. They don't really care about animals. They're just doing it because they think it looks good or something like that. But I think that that can actually often be just a result of the fact that these people are talking about it so much that you basically become insensitive to it. Mm, OK, I can see that. I mean, I've had that happen even just with uh, me going on other people's podcasts talking about my health experience. Even when I went to Oxford and talked about my health experience, it's like at a certain point, I've talked about it so much that 
and which is good psychologically. So I've like desensitized myself to it. So it's not traumatizing anymore, but it's also, it also means that the emotions associated with it aren't like raw, like they were. And it's just, yeah. Yeah. I, I, <laughs> I remember uh, when you were in Oxford and we took a picture together and posted it on Instagram and I got quite a lot of messages from my vegan followers and even my, my non-vegan followers sort of being like, why are you hanging out with the, the antithesis of the vegan movement? Because <laughs> I'm I mean, not the antithesis <laughs> though. That's but, the thing is like I stopped, I had an issue with animal suffering for my entire life. I stopped eating pork when I was like 14 because I figured, you know, Pigs are the most intelligent. They probably suffer the most and I don't have to eat that. Um, I've always thought meat was healthy and I think that's probably because my grandpa hunted. So it was like in my family. Um, but but I mean, even since carnivore or lion diet, I've tried to be careful about where my animals are from. And I have enough money that it's not difficult for me to source um, meat from farms that raise the animals in like, the best way I see possible, if you are going to end up killing an animal, at least not factory farming, right? So I'm definitely on board with the reduce, reduce suffering. And I think that that helps, you know, factory farming is also an issue for the environment as well, right? And it's, it's just certainly. like not, that's not a comfortable way to live. And if you watch like anybody who watches videos of factory farming, it's like, that's not good, right? Nothing about that looks good. Yeah, it seems like everybody knows this, but but it's worth bearing in mind that some something like I I, I want to say over ninety five percent of animal products consumed. I'm not sure about America. I think it's higher. I think it's something like ninety eight percent. But the vast majority of animal products consumed come from factory farms. Of course, if you ask people on the street, you know, do you do you eat meat or something like this, and they can tell that you're sort of maybe going to raise an ethical concern, they'll they'll often say something like. Well, yeah, but I try to make sure that I get it from the best kind of sources. I know that there are people in the world who who do do this. There are a lot of people. Um, but at the same time, I find it quite a mystery that pretty much anybody that I speak to about this will say, yeah, I try to make sure that my my meat and my animal products come from from ethical sources. And that makes up the vast majority of people. And yet it is simultaneously the case that the vast majority of our animal products are coming from factory farms. I'm not sure that people are being either totally honest or maybe they don't quite understand the the breadth of factory farming and the the grasp that it has over our over our food. Of course, if you're really tracking the food, if you've got your own farm or something like that, then it's easy enough. But you know, if you walk into a, a supermarket or a restaurant or a fast food chain into a KFC into a Starbucks or something, this is all factory farmed. And the real strength of the vegan movement is against factory farming, right? Like my the reason that I'm sort of like getting up on a soapbox as it were and, and trying to proselytize about this kind of thing veganism as it's sometimes called is really because of the plight of animals in factory farms you know if we were still doing farming how we were a few hundred years ago it would still be a, an interesting ethical problem to solve it would still be uh, especially if we have alternatives available there'd be an important ethical question as to whether we have the right to breed animals into existence and, and take their lives away from them and inflict certain sufferings in their life but it certainly wouldn't be the, the forefront of my campaigning. It wouldn't be the main thing that I spend my time doing. It's really about the factory farming, which is why I say when, when people were surprised to, to, to see, I mean, even, even if you were the antithesis of vegan, like to take a picture together, I mean, it's, it's hardly the most incriminating thing in the world. But I, I got that impression just from talking to you then as well, that, that at least ostensibly we're both against, let's say, unnecessary animal suffering. And that's what the vegan position, in, in my view, essentially reduces to. And you're right to say that there's an environmental problem as well. That's actually not something that I talk about very much because I think that more people are going yeah. vegan now for the environment rather than the ethics, which, sure, it's, it's kind of admirable, but it seems to me like it sort of misses the point uh, ethically. It would be as if we were sort of stood on a hill and we saw this factory in the distance. It was like a puppy mill that was breeding and torturing puppies and forcing them into cages and disbudding them and this kind of thing. And you said, oh, this is so terrible. We need to end this. And I said, yeah. And you said, I mean, just look at the fumes it's emitting. It, it's so bad for the environment. It's like, okay, you're, you're not wrong. You're not incorrect about that. But I feel like you're sort of maybe missing the ethical point here. The real, the real uh, motivating uh, factor of all of this for me is, is the suffering. But look, we have an animal suffering problem in factory farming, which on its own, in my view, I've said this a few times before, on its own, 
is a good enough reason to abolish factory farming and probably go vegan. There's an environmental case against factory farming because they're just absolutely disastrous to the environment, which again, on its own, the environmental case would be good enough reason to abolish factory farming. There's also a pandemic prevention case. I did a TEDx talk about this, that while our governments were telling us to keep as far apart from each other as possible, we're simultaneously cramming tens of billions of disease-ridden animals into these ridiculous ignoble hell holes to share their diseases with each other and just exponentially increase the risk of them developing into a zoonotic disease with the potential to infect other human beings. So the pandemic prevention on its own, when you know, when our governments say they're doing everything they can to prevent this kind of thing happening again, it's like, give me a break, as long as factory farming is still on the scene, it's an absolute joke. That on its own is good enough reason to abolish factory farming. Antibiotic resistance. Most people know that antibiotic yeah, resistance is the, is the big, big fear one. of the medical community. But the majority, the majority of antibiotics that are sold are used on livestock, not human beings, right? And so this is driving your antibiotic resistance. So what you have here, and there's also like health concerns, but I think that's a bit more technical. So, but just take those four, right? You've got the suffering case, the environmental case, the antibiotic resistance case, pandemic prevention case, which each on their own is enough reason to abolish factory farming. But we have all four of them, all of them together on one side of the scale. And then I ask people, what's on the other side of the scale? For most people, it's a sausage roll. It's milk in your coffee. Well, I see that's bacon where, in the that, morning. This is where we disagree. And I think this is uh, this was brought up with some of the people on the vegan side for the for the Oxford debate. Uh, one guy was talking about, oh, um, you how do you weigh pleasure? How do you weigh suffering against the pleasure you experience eating meat? And what I would argue is, especially in, in, in America, um, I think the major cause behind chronic disease is diet. And I think that a plant-based push is going to make people sicker. And I think removing meat from people's diet, I don't think we understand the um, repercussions of doing that. So it's funny because everybody who's concerned about this is concerned about suffering on some level. So uh, animal suffering, right? For people who are more concerned about the climate, I think they're they're basically concerned about human suffering, right? Because if the climate gets all screwed up, then eventually that leads to human suffering. And what I'm concerned about is just human suffering. And I know, for, and I'm biased from my experience and from what I've seen for people who've gone paleo and kind of gone back to ancestral eating, is being chronically ill. Like I would, I would stop the suffering of somebody who's chronically ill, and. I, I don't even like animals don't even cross my mind like that amount of suffering compared to a human being that's chronically ill. And so I think that's where we might differ unless I'm potentially mistaken. I mean, it, it, it requires a bit more digging for, for a start. You said that you only care about human suffering. Um, I, I, should I don't clarify. only care. That's not true. Right. That's if what we I want can to reduce like regenerative farming and I've advertised this quite a bit. Hopefully I've talked about it on my podcast. We should be making a move towards regenerative farming and the more people that buy meat from regenerative farms the more likely regenerative farms are to take off but i would rather see a push towards regenerative farming than towards veganism because i think those are going to have major health repercussions that we can't foresee at the moment or that we are foreseeing but not attributing to less meat yes on, on an animal suffering front a regenerative system of farming is is infinitely preferable to factory farming. Uh, you're still going to run into an ethical qualm when it comes to taking lives that don't need to be taken. Um, I, I guess I'm a bit more relaxed than than most vegans, and I don't even like using the word vegan because people are sometimes upset with exactly how I how I um, use the word, how I define it, or the situations in which I think it would be permissible to eat animal products. A lot of people uh, have have told me that. Uh, it's potentially misleading. Really, I just have a commitment to minimizing animal suffering. So, coming at this from an from a from an ethics perspective, more than a practical one, I, I quite simply just grant the conditional. Right, if it is the case that this is going to minimize suffering, then that's the right thing to do. So, if it turns out, let's say that sort of um, hunting is actually a better way to procure our nutritional requirements because of course we could eat plants but you know plant production plant agriculture requires killing animals too and it's possible that in some circumstances hunting an animal might kill less animals and it might actually be uh, less painful for that animal like i don't know about the practicalities of that i, I actually I, I don't know but I'm, I'm just willing to just grant easily that if it is actually the case that that involves less animal suffering then that is the thing to do now most 
Most people define veganism, at least the vegan society defines it as a minimization or an exclusion to the highest extent practicable of all forms of animal exploitation. Um, I like to use the word animal suffering there. Um, and and it, it means it's got a slightly strange implication, which is that if veganism is just excluding animal suffering to the highest extent practicable, then even if you are killing an animal for food, if you're doing it in such a way that genuinely minimizes to the highest extent practicable all forms of animal suffering or exploitation, then it's not just that you're permissibly breaking veganism or something, like you're, you're doing the vegan thing according to the ethical definition. Because, of course, vegans shouldn't be under the, the illusion that we're not responsible for any animal suffering. Of course we are. We need to, most people know about the problem of crop deaths, right? Like that animals are being killed in the production of plants. Of course, vastly more plants are currently being uh, used to feed to livestock, and so the best way to minimize even just crop deaths is to eat the crops directly because it takes less crops to feed a human than it does to, to, to feed livestock. But in other words, like if you think that veganism means that you don't harm animals in the production of your food, then what, what are you eating exactly? You're probably going to be starving yourself. And so even for the, for the, for the vegan who eats nothing but plants, we're still contributing to some animal suffering, we just recognize that by eating the plants directly, we're contributing to a lot less. So we already grant the idea that to be vegan is just to minimize animal suffering to the highest extent that we can, which means that if there were a situation in which the way to minimize the amount of animal suffering was to go and, you know, shoot the elk, then go and shoot the elk and call yourself a vegan for all I care. I'm just interested in the ethics of minimizing suffering here. <laughs> that was great. I like that. Okay. Okay. I brought you on to talk about a few things. Not just veganism. That was good, though. I liked that last bit a lot. I, I'm in agreement there. I think. Yeah, I mean, I think I think we agree more than people think that that we do. I mean, your your condition is is different as well. Your situation, I mean to say, because of the the fact that, like, as far as I understand, like the reason why. I mean, it's it's funny. Your your diet will be more restrictive than mine is as as a, as a vegan. Oh my gosh! Which is, yeah, it's which awful. Is, um, which is quite strange, but. Of course, there's, 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 there's a world of difference between your sort of average Joe who like eats KFC because he thinks it's, it tastes nice and animals are here for us to, to kill, bro. And somebody who says, look, I just actually need this to survive and be healthy. Like these are different justifications and embedded into the definition of veganism is practicability. That's kind of the operative word. So like, uh, of course, if, if it were going to like when somebody says um, it's not healthy to be vegan, the vegan response is usually, well, yes, it is. Like, look at these, look at these studies. Look at, look at the the scientific consensus or whatever. Like, vegans generally don't say something like, well, I don't care if it's unhealthy. You have to do it anyway, right? They say, no, it is healthy, and that's why you have an obligation to do it. But the implication of that, the corollary, is that if it were not healthy, if it were genuinely not healthy and not sustainable for you, then it would be permissible to to eat animals, and and that's a position that I hold, and I think is a position that's embedded into the very definition of veganism. So. If you look at the definition of ethical veganism, look at what it's actually about. It's a it's a lot more um, it's a lot more sort of inclusive and relaxed, I think, than might be represented by certain vegan activists that you might see on the street screaming about you know drinking drinking milk under any circumstances. It's just about minimizing suffering, which most people are already committed to. Okay, I like it. Now, normally at the beginning of each episode, I ask people who they are and what they do, but we just mm. kind of got into it. For, oh, so, sure. so can, uh, <laughs> if anyone hasn't figured it out by now, uh, can you give a brief background about who you are and what it is you do? Um, so I, I'm a, I'm a vegan, um, <laughs> which it's actually amazing that I, that I haven't said that yet. That's usually, it's not even how I introduce myself in podcasts. It's just how I introduce myself to anybody. It's the first thing I say before my name. Um, my name is Alex O'Connor, um, and I'm something of a reluctant vegan, actually. I started life on YouTube making videos about the philosophy of religion. Quite embarrassing, really, embarrassingly, really. I started when I was oh, 16, 17, something like that, and so some of the older material is just embarrassingly poor. Um, but it's been interesting to sort of be able to track this philosophical change and growth. So I made videos about the philosophy of religion, which moved on to talking about philosophy more broadly, and then ethics, and then somebody, well, people kept kind of asking me, uh, uh, just as okay. like a, a fringe issue. It was sort of like, you know, people would ask me about abortion or euthanasia or, you know, capital punishment or veganism. And I thought, you know, I'll get around to all of these. And one day I, I finally decided to sit down and read Animal Liberation by Peter Singer, which is to this day the greatest philosophical defense of the vegan position that exists. Um, it was written in 1975. 
and well philosophy is perennial the first chapter it's it reads just as well today and i just remember thinking like i must be missing something it was so so straightforward and so i made a video on my youtube channel saying it was called a meat eater's case for veganism and i said look here are some arguments that i'm considering i think these lead towards towards the vegan position the vegan philosophy Please, for the love of God, somebody talk me out of it. Please. I really like, not only do I want to change my mind for the usual uh, reason of just, you know, intellectual consistency and self-challenge, but because I actually really don't want this to be true. I, I'm, I'm a big fan of, of, of KFC in particular. Um, I should say taste-wise, not morally. Uh, and nobody could. And it's funny, in that video in the beginning, I said in the introduction, oh, don't worry, everybody, this channel isn't becoming like a, a vegan advocacy channel or something like that. I'm just making one video. It's like whoops um but it's because no, nobody nobody could talk me out of it and so since then i've i've become something of a sort of vegan youtuber speaker so i'm invited to you know do talks and podcasts and stuff and it's probably the main thing now that i that i talk about but it happened um essentially by accident when was that that was 2019 uh, april of 2019 so not sort of that long ago actually uh but i mean it, it feels like it's been it's been forever and even in that time, like my position has wildly changed. I mean, it started with this case of like, wow, I had no idea about any of this. I'm just going to put a hold on all my animal product consumption until I have a bit more time to sort of work it all out. And I've spoken to people from, it's, it's the great thing about being a being a podcaster, having an opportunity, as, as you'll know, to be able to just speak to so many wonderful, yeah, interesting yeah. people. So I've been able to speak to ethicists and uh, you know, dietitians, and I've been able to speak to psychologists about the nature of pain in the brain and how it works and this kind of thing. And um, so my sort of position has been consistently evolving, but not once have I come close to doubting the idea that if we can avoid inflicting suffering upon an animal, then we should do so. Um, that, so the main thing that, that changed my mind on that was uh, an argument. It was, a, it was a sometimes called name the trait, which basically asks... There are a few ways to, to word it, but you might want to ask something like, okay, so 86% of pigs or thereabouts in the UK who are killed for slaughter are killed in gas chambers. So they're forced into metal cages and lowered into chambers of carbon dioxide, which um, is, I mean, you can watch it on YouTube and you can see it's a pretty painful experience. It also like acidifies the liquids in their eyes and, and mouths. Okay, so this is, this is pretty gross. Now we would recognize that if we were to force human beings into a gas chamber, that would be wrong. In fact, it would be evocative of one of the worst evils in human history. And so the name the trait argument can be surmised as saying something like, well, how like a pig and in what ways would that human have to be before you'd be okay with forcing it into a gas chamber? So you name the trait. So some people say that, well, pigs are far less intelligent than humans are, and that's why we have more moral worth. So, okay, so the trait is intelligence. So let's take a human being and let's lower their intelligence lower their intelligence to the state of a pig so let's give them like the, the tiniest cognitive ability that you can imagine can i force that human being into a gas chamber off the back of that no in fact you'd probably consider it more evil to do that on the justification that they have a low intelligence okay so what if i gave the human being like two new legs instead of arms can i force them into a gas chamber or well, definitely not what about if i made their skin pink you know is, is is skin color the relevant factor here well definitely not okay so you can essentially metamorphize this human being into a pig you can say, well, let's take this human being, give him four legs, pink skin, curly tail, intelligence level of a pig, you know, experiences the world as a pig, suffers like a pig. Can I force this human being into a gas chamber? And it seems like you never get to a point where you say, okay, now we found the justification. Now it's okay. You can put this being into a gas chamber. But you end up with a creature that's identical to the creature that we started with, which is the one that we force into gas chambers. And, and not, to, not to win a war not to buttress the economy, not to build infrastructure, but because we think they taste nice. And it just seemed ethically obvious to me. And so I thought I must be missing something if this is still such a sort of fringe minority view. And so the past few years of my life have been an exercise in you know, trying to get people to talk me out of it. Mm, you should talk to uh, Diana Rogers because your, your argument makes sense if meat wasn't, I think, necessary for health. And I think, I think, I think that there's a lack of studies. I think that the studies are there. And I think Diana Rogers, um, who's a dietitian, who does, uh, she wrote the sacred cow, and she's very interested in regenerative agriculture, regenerative farming. Um, but I, I think your argument would stand if it was just about taste, and if we could get all the nutrients from a vegan diet. But I think 
that the long term, I don't think long term veganism helps people. And that, that's like mostly what I've read online, anecdotes, and then studies. I also know that if you put really, really young kids on a vegan diet, that can be really harder on their brain. But if they eat animal products, it's not. So I think I think your argument would stand true and would be impenetrable if if meat wasn't such a health food. Yes. Um, and of course, uh, you're right that the science is still very much in its infancy and, and we must be careful. OK, like this is really important. If there is a, a risk that this is actually really not nutritionally adequate and we're feeding it to children, not really knowing what we're doing and essentially blinded by by what becomes ideology, it, it uh, merges from just a commitment to minimizing animal suffering to an allegiance to vague principles that are sort of followed no matter what because they're just sort of thought to be true by a community then we run into run into problems as i say i'm sort of willing to grant this this conditional claim that if it's not actually healthy then not only is it sort of morally permissible to not be a vegan as it were but to basically eat the the, the minimal amount that we need to be healthy and still call yourself a vegan. I mean, we could probably do away with the word. It wouldn't be very helpful. Um, but of course, it's worth bearing in mind that if it's the case that we think, OK, well, well, meat is required for a for a healthy diet or at least animal products of a kind. Uh, sure. But this, of course, doesn't give us license to overindulge. And it doesn't give us license to uh, procure these products from factory farms. I mean, even if it is the case that we need these products, in order to be healthy, there is simply no excuse, none, for what we're currently doing to animals, for what is, as I say, essentially an overconsumption problem. The numbers involved are just like unthinkably, unthinkably huge, especially when you think about sea life, which is just the most incredible. Mm, I mean, mm, yeah. I, I, sometimes I like to say, I, I don't quite know how to get it across, so sometimes I just say, since I started this sentence, around 150,000 wild fish have been caught from our oceans, which is roughly four seconds. And in the space of two minutes, that will have risen to 3.6 million in two minutes, right? The numbers involved are, are huge, but also the, the lived experience of these animals, pigs forced into gas chambers, cows being separated from their calves. You know, you, everybody knows about this kind of stuff. Um, it's, and so- It's not good. Diane, yeah, you should it, talk to Diana Rogers. Like she makes a good case. I, um, I, I watched her. There's also a documentary she did. It's called Sacred Cow. And she talks about how, yeah. you, um, well, it seems like a good alternative if we're to continue eating meat. Because I, like, I'm in agreement with you that factory farming. Well, basically what I, what I tell people who watch my channel is, you know, and I give them a bit of, uh, more leeway. I say buy, what you, buy the best you can afford. So there's like companies like White Oak Pastures that are doing a really good job. And like there, there are companies out there that are doing regenerative farming. Buy from those guys if you can. Um, a lot of the people who follow me have autoimmune disorders or trying to get out of them and are really sick and they're like in bed. And so for those people, I'm like, do what you have to do to survive. And then once you get better, which is kind of what I did because I didn't yes. have very much money to begin with. And I just like got off my medication, got better. And then now, well... I've been eating, you know, grass fed, whatever for like three years, but, um, you should talk yeah. to her just to see, just to see if the, she the, can like poke any holes. Yeah, I, I have, I have come, a, come, a, come across her work. I, I may have read the book actually, or at least I probably own a copy somewhere at the very least. Um, but yeah, you're quite right. There's a, one, one of the PR problems that veganism has is, is one of being quite unempathetic for a, for a movement that's supposed to be grounded in empathy. I think it's worth remembering this. When when I say that veganism is about minimizing animal suffering to the highest extent practicable, people think about okay. So if you're um, if you're an Inuit living in northern Canada, and it's genuinely really expensive to to import vegetables, okay, fine, you know, eat the meat because you can't afford it. But I think we need to be a bit broader in what we encompass in terms of practicability. So I like to encompass things like, for instance, you know, sometimes I get messages from from kids who say, like, I really want to try this veganism thing or at least sort of minimize my diet, but but I live at home and, and my mum cooks my meals for me and she she doesn't want to hear it. And they're really stressed out. They're like, I, but I don't, I don't know what to do. Like, I can't refuse to eat this stuff. And I'm just like, relax. Like, it, it's okay. Like, this is the kind of thing that I think is included in practicability. Like, sure, okay, technically you could, like, you know, say, screw you, mum, and, and, you know, steal some money and go down to the shop and buy your own food or whatever. But, like, no, I think it's it's fine. Like, you, you can talk to her about it over the dinner table and, and say why you're not particularly comfortable with it. And, and maybe it will 
get her to, to change the cooking a little bit, but it's certainly not unethical to eat that food, right? And so the, the practicability requirement, I think, should be considered quite broadly. And so it would include things like living at home with your parents. It would certainly include things like eating disorders, definitely things like autoimmune diseases, especially if, as you say, you're sort of bedridden and, and your, your life is falling to bits. Like, that's pretty much the definition of impracticability, which I like to remind people is embedded into the definition of veganism. So it's all about empathy. And we need to remember that, of course, humans are animals just like any other. And so we need to be empathetic to those too, uh, and understand that people will put their health interests first. Um, so th this is, but this is the interesting thing and why I thought it would be interesting to talk to you, because I think that we, at least on the sort of philosophical principles, let's say, are, are roughly in alignment. I think our, our different life experiences have, have probably shaped how we think about the practicability of eating meat. I mean, living in a city like Oxford, it's, it's the easiest thing in the world to pop down to the supermarket and buy meat alternatives. And I don't have any serious allergies or anything like that. So, you know, it, it's sort of easy enough for me to say, you know, everybody stop eating meat, right? But as I talk to more people and begin to understand that not everybody's in such a comfortable position, it's quite edifying and leads me to, to when I speak about veganism, try to be a bit broader in terms of uh, what might be counted in terms of the, the practicability requirement, if you see what I'm saying. Interesting. Okay. That's cool. I'm always, I'm always uh, surprised when I talk to vegans at how, like my, my immune system is nuts, right? My, I, I shouldn't be alive. Like things, something out there doesn't want me alive. I'm allergic to everything in ways that's just shocking. So mm. when I talk to people, or even when I see like other meat eaters or just people eating like bread and things and looking like normal people, like how is that possible? Like how can I be so different. Even my brother, it's like, he'll go out and have a piece of pizza. And I was like, if I had a piece of pizza, I think I would die. Like, <laughs> like how is it that different between yeah. people sometimes? But so it's I, the I thing. No I mean, I, I can't imagine uh, having an experience like that, having to be so, so careful. And, and it's like, um, Oh, you know, like it reminds me of people who have like serious nut allergies and, and the thought of, you know, sometimes yeah, when I'm sort of sat on a plane or something. I have a like nut that. allergy too. Really? I don't have a nut. I don't have a nut allergy. Like if someone ate a nut beside yeah. me, I would die. But I, um, I can't eat nuts without. I had an people... EpiPen for a long time. Like it's just, just stupid allergies. Yeah, and I, I think about it, and I, I just realized, like I, I don't even know what it would be like to have to think every time you get on a, on a bus or a plane or something. Like, what if somebody opens a packet of nuts, and then my life is in danger? It's like, it's, it's crazy, right? And, mm -hmm. and. It, it's just it's incredibly important to sort of be a bit human about this this kind of thing because we get a bit lost in the in the in the abstract philosophy or in the the the, the ideology and the the, the debate um, but this is really just about as ethics always has been historically it's about sort of how human beings can live the best kind of life um, I just like to remind people that if you're committed to a vague notion of minimizing suffering then the position boils down to something like whenever you have the opportunity to, uh, let's say, prevent or um, you know, not inflict suffering to animals, you know, take it. Like, that's it. I mean, if you, if you don't have that opportunity, if that opportunity isn't available to you, then fine. But as long as it is, I'm just recommending that that's the course of action that people should take. And there are people are already on board with this in, in principle. Um, but in practice, like you walk into a shop and if you don't have serious allergies, and I recognize that your audience is going to be disproportionately different in this respect, but there'll be some people listening who have no serious allergies, who have pretty good access to, to all kinds of foods in the supermarket and, and live in a city where it's actually, you know, not going to be more or less expensive. But you walk into that shop and, uh, you know, you go into Starbucks and you order a latte and what are you paying for? Are well, you paying for a cow to be forcibly impregnated, separated from the calf? That calf might be bolt gunned in the head, turned into veal, or raised to go through a similar cycle of exploitation. The dairy cow will, you know, go through this 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 cycle before being sold to a slaughterhouse uh, to be to be killed because the dairy and the meat industry are, are pretty tied up in this way. Where it, I mean, if it's an Islamic slaughterhouse, the last thing it will hear is Bismillah Allahu Akbar and the sound of its own blood gushing to the floor. Okay, walk into the same Starbucks and add one word. I'll have an oat latte. I'll have an almond latte. I'll have a soy latte. 
have a hazelnut latte, one of the myriad options now available to us. And none of this happens on your dime. You're not paying for this anymore. And a lot of people say, like, what we're weighing up is, like, the, the life of a cow and it's, and it's suffering. And, you know, I don't like to anthropomorphize when I talk about calves being separated from their mothers. I, I'm not trying to be cutesy. Like, the maternal bond that animals have is something very much pre-human and, and certainly sort of pre-rational. Um, you can watch these, these sadistic videos. It, it's almost comic. There are these technologies invented, like a, like a truck or a quad bike with a, with a cage and an open door on the side of it, and they drive around and they sort of scoop up the calf and drive her away. And you can watch these, these mother cows chasing after their children in, in confusion. Um, and people say that we're like weighing this up, the suffering of the, the animal versus like the, the taste of milk or something or, or the convenience of milk. And it's not even that. It's not. Because what it really is, is like the life of an animal on one side of the scale. And then you have the, the taste, pleasure and the convenience, whatever, minus what you can get from a vegan alternative. And it's the leftover slither that we weigh up against the life of the animal. So even if, you know, oat milk doesn't taste quite as nice as cow's milk, which I, I don't know if it does. It, it's a preferential thing. But let's say it's like 80% as nice. So you say it really isn't as nice. It's like... Okay, you're not weighing up a cow's life versus the, the taste of milk. You're weighing up a cow's life versus like 20% of the taste pleasure that you get from milk because the, the other 80% could have been gotten from oat milk, if you see what I'm saying. So it's, it's pretty, um, it, it's worse than people think, uh, in, in, in but, other words. Well, that, I like, get where you're coming from there. But if my theory is correct and that people can't be healthy without animal products, and I'm actually putting dairy in a different category because... I can't tolerate dairy without really bad, getting really bad arthritis and mul like a multitude of issues. So I, I don't mm. eat dairy or eggs. Um, they both caused issues. But if you do weigh, um, let's say, the, the, the taste of milk, that's what you have on one side, and then the difference between like oat and oat milk and normal milk to the suffering of a cow. That's Those are on your two sides. What if the problem with reducing your animal intake is actually chronic health problems? And then what you have on one side is an increase in chronic health problems. And then that's suffering compared to the life of an animal. And well, then, chronic then, health problems, like that, that's a different story, right? But I mean, we, it's not even, it's not yes. that useful at the moment to have a conversation about that because we need more data. I think part of the reason I've been fighting back against, um, kind of what I've called the vegan ideology is because my concern is we have these people who are implementing agendas in major cities. So as you're doing like meatless Monday and things without the proper scientific background. So we don't have proper studies on these things. Now we have studies like, oh, an increase in meat increases your risk of, I don't know, everything, right? Like there's, there's any study out there that you can say it increases your risk of heart disease or et cetera. Most of those studies aren't done isolating meat. They're done combining everything else you eat with meat. So the bun, the pop, like everything. And it would make me feel a lot better if people who were implementing um, veganism in major cities and saying you have to reduce the amount of meat you eat, even what's been happening in the Netherlands recently with taking away kind of farmer's land saying you need to produce less nitrogen. Um, and that means you can't you can't farm cows anymore. Uh, it would make me feel a lot better if I didn't feel like there weren't studies being done as well. It's like this, this issue with chronic disease in North America, it's like killing people and reducing the life expectancy of people. And if that has to do with diet and that has to do with animal products and we're pushing a, a vegan agenda to minimize animal suffering and to minimize climate change without looking at that part, we are in for a world of pain in like 10 years. Yes, I mean, potentially. Um, I, I imagine you probably receive similar concerns about the the carnivore diet, um, about its potential health implications, and that that you know there are sort of maybe like there's sort of a bit of data on this sort of being oh my healthy, gosh. but it's one hundred percent. But it's potentially sort of disastrous in the in the. I mean, I don't know actually about the sort of long term. Has there been much research into the, the long term been, effect of? There hasn't been any, which is the issue. Like this, yeah. the carnivore diet is ridiculously new and the anecdotal reports are insane. Like you have people who lost a bunch of weight are off all of their medications and have a disease that was incurable in remission, which doesn't happen, right? You, you can't do that. There are some people, you know, you hear anecdotes with people who go on the vegan diet too, and they're suddenly in remission. And yes. I know 
And I think that there's a reason for that. I think that if you reduce the amount of dairy you're eating or eliminate dairy and eliminate eggs, I think that those can cause a lot of health issues for people. And if you eliminate processed foods, that can make you a lot healthier right off the bat. And that can all happen with a vegan diet, right? And that's something everybody should be doing regardless of what diet they're on. This episode is sponsored by NordVPN. If you've followed the show for a while, then you have probably heard me complain about Canada and complain about Canadian Netflix. If you Americans don't know, Netflix in Canada is bad. I mean, Netflix has been kind of bad in America recently too, but I suppose at least it has variety. I used NordVPN to watch the best shows on Netflix anywhere in the world from Canada. Now that I live in good old Florida, I don't have that issue anymore, but I still like to safeguard my online activity. NordVPN uses state-of-the-art encryption that keeps you safe from third parties who want to watch your online activity. It also protects you from hackers, malware, and other malicious threats that exist all over the internet. NordVPN's virtual private network uses encrypted connections to guarantee your online privacy. With their global coverage, using 5,300 servers around the world, NordVPN doesn't buffer or crash like other VPNs. Better safe than sorry with all the weirdness in the world right now. NordVPN protects you from anyone knowing what websites you've been visiting, and I think given the political atmosphere right now, it's worth doing just in case. Grab your exclusive NordVPN deal by going to nordvpn.com slash TMPP to get a huge discount off your NordVPN plan plus four months for free. It's completely risk-free with Nord's 30-day money-back guarantee. Sign up for NordVPN and enjoy the rest of this episode. Um, yes, I mean, that's that's the funny thing about it, especially if you go vegan for sort of health reasons or, or let's say health reasons because you haven't been particularly healthy before or ethical reasons because you, you're not that interested in health. If you're eating an average American diet, then of course, when you eat a well-planned vegan diet, you're going to feel healthier. And so people often report sort of these crazy energy boosts. They feel cleaner. They feel healthier. They're losing weight, this kind of thing. Uh, f- for myself, I kind of... I. I feel I want to say sort of roughly the same I don't think it sort of makes it a, a huge um a huge difference either way but yeah we we have to be we have to be careful I think of course to be a healthy vegan is going to be more difficult than being a, a healthy meat eater at least in terms of sufficiently healthy so if you sort of just eat vague animal products if you just like eat some chicken eggs few vegetables this kind of thing like you're not going to be in in great nutritional shape but you'll be okay if you take a similar approach as a vegan and you just sort of like eat whatever you just have like a a vegan cheese sandwich and 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 some pasta you're going to be in a lot more trouble and so well you know as as far as i'm aware it is possible certainly for adults and and a lot of dietetic associations across the world are, are saying that it's uh, you can get all the nutrients required for a healthy living at all stages of life but you're right like we should be skeptical of these things we, and we need to especially when it comes to raising children on these diets we we want to be sure right we don't want to be sort of like well this this dietetic association seems to think it's fine so let's go ahead and do it it's like let's let's really do some research here but just like the research into the carnival diet which you say is like brand new i mean yeah, the it's brand science new. on the vegan stuff is still in its infancy too. Like this is this is all fairly new, so we do need to be careful. But equally, a lot of the time, if if you pay attention to what it is that went wrong with people um, on vegan diets, it's something that could at least in principle have been avoided. But as I say, like the thing that I really like to stress is that it is I've said a few times now is this conditional claim that if it is actually unhealthy, then I think it's permissible, right? But as I say. I would still be committed to minimizing our intake and certainly from um, completely eliminating our intake when it comes to, to factory farms. Okay. Because the fact, I mean, the factory farming problem is, is partly an overconsumption thing too, right? Like if you, if you think to yourself, well, this stuff's maybe wrong. And so everybody starts sort of minimizing their intake. Let's say it, it, you really do need meat to be healthy or something like this. One of the reasons why factory farming exists is because of the, the, the amount of animal products that people are eating. It's just like not sustainable to have. Um, apparently, apparently, according to this Diana Rogers character, um, apparently if everybody switched to regenerative farming and there was no factory farming, the output would be similar, which I find difficult to believe given how many animals are in factory farms. But I mean, I, I've asked 
them, the people who wrote that book, the same question, which was, okay, switching to regenerative farming is all good, but say people do need meat for health and say we need the same amount of meat we're producing. Can you do that with regenerative farming? And she thought we could. And part of the reason we mm. could do that is because you can put animals like goats and things on mountainous areas where nothing else can grow anyway, and they can still survive. Right. So you can still be eating plants on like rocky terrain where you wouldn't be able to have other things. So apparently, yeah, but then I, I mean, would still be the same. But we're talking about somewhere between 80 and 100 billion land animals alone every single year. Sam, I'm scared. I mean, I, I would say that it's certainly possible that, uh, especially if people start eating more healthily and become more aware of their diets and uh, minimizing their meat intake or something like this, that a, a global regenerative system of agriculture would be enough to sustain healthy living for everybody but to say that we'd get the same output i, I don't mean know. I, we I, should, i'm not sure I'll, I'll have to yeah maybe we need to i, I want to ask you about oh my gosh it's been an hour already okay How's it? we might have to have another podcast because i wanted to do <laughs> i wanted to ask you about your your atheism beliefs and get into that but that could be yeah. let's just leave that for the next one because that could be an entire thing on its own if you like um Perhaps at, at some point we should have, uh, maybe I'll watch the video again, the sacred cow video, because I was surprised about uh, like what she claimed in it, but it was pretty interesting. And maybe mm. we could have a conversation about that again to see if there's common ground there. I, I think that there's an, a lot of overlap between how you're thinking and how I'm thinking. And I think it all kind of chalks up to, you know, if you could do a vegan diet and be equally as healthy, even if it's more difficult to achieve that. Like, but if you're careful and you can be equally as healthy, then I don't see anything wrong with it. The only reason that I see something wrong with it is because I believe that you're missing key nutrients and that, and I think the only way to like rectify that position are to have more studies and like properly done studies. So you talked about evidence for the carnivore diet. The only thing that we have at the moment for the carnivore diet is a study that was done basically on self-reported symptoms symptoms yes. from people and so that's going to skew towards people who are already feeling better and like anybody in the scientific community would just laugh at that study however it's enough those aren't that's like three thousand anecdotes of people saying i was really chronically ill and now i'm not at all and that should be enough for somebody in the scientific community to say hey why don't we do a controlled study like we need to do a controlled study it's not that difficult you take some people who are have autoimmune disorders you monitor their diet for six months and then see what happens. It just needs to happen, right? And then at least we could have a conversation about, oh, you know, wow, there was overwhelming success. This needs to be taken seriously. Or, oh, no, this is a one-off. But, like, I don't see any – I don't know what to do without more data. Yes, it, it's, it's, it's pretty difficult to know. But uh, I don't think we need really any data to know that factory farming needs to come to an end. Um, now, well, we have it, data for that too. Yeah, we actually we do like e even just the um, what it does to the environment factory. Farming. Yes, of course. But you know, you, you, need, you need idea. only and uh, antibiotic, antibiotic resistance that enough, like you said, that yeah. alone could be that could be so bad for everybody on the planet that we, right. we need to avoid that at all costs. Right? Yeah, this is well, this is why the, the COVID pandemic can sort of serve as a, as a wake-up call, as people often like to, 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 not to frame this Not if it was this, leaked this from a lab, Alex. Not, not, not if, no, if but, it was leaked from a lab. Know, pe people have actually misunderstood the, the point that I make when it comes to COVID particularly, because, of course, COVID is, uh, at least, you know, uh, it, it's thought a zoonotic disease. Um, kind of doesn't really matter. I mean, I, I, I would certainly not claim that, that this COVID pandemic came from factory farming. Like, that's definitely not the case. Uh, but we can say that like, but the next one will, right? We can, we can say, if we look at something like COVID and look at how quickly we can just completely debilitate our entire population. And then we think, okay, how can we stop this kind of thing happening again? Regardless of where these diseases have come from in the past, if, if we're taking disease ridden animals and we're forcing them into close proximity in tiny cages and then shipping them around the world to share diseases with each other, the chances of a zoonotic disease developing is being exponentially increased. And so even if the last pandemic didn't come from factory farming, it's very likely that the next one, that the next one will. Um, but of course, all of this, by the way, all of this uh, about the, the animal suffering and the gas chambers and the disbudding, and I haven't talked about the experience of pigs in factory farms, which I think are the worst. Um, uh, well, it's not, it's not the worst, but pigs 
for some reason for me have always been the the most easy to empathize with maybe due to their intelligence similarity to dogs whatever but like f for example um piglets who who are born on factory farms if they're too sick to be profitable and this is often after having their teeth yanked out and their tails cut off without anesthetic which by the way why would they do that why would they yank teeth out and cut the tails off piglets when they're born well it's because as the pigs are kept in close proximity later in life they start to basically go insane and and, and start cannibalizing each other out of frustration and hunger um, and so they often do that by biting each other's tails uh, at, at first and so they, they take out the teeth and get rid of the tails but okay if these if these piglets are too sick to be profitable then what happens to them well they'll be killed most people can probably work that out but how are they killed well the most well a, one of the most common methods is a, is a method that's colloquially known as thumping it's blunt force trauma it's where the pigs are literally just taken by their hind legs these piglets and have their skulls repeatedly smashed into the concrete until they die. Um, of course, you can watch footage of this, and it seems when you see this kind of stuff that it's like you know, rogue farmers picking up animals and smashing their skulls into the pavement. But this method of caving in a piglet's skull against the pavement is officially approved by both Red Tractor and the RSPCA, which are kind of the, the animal welfare governing bodies in the UK when it comes to farm. By the way, the same RSPCA that recently confiscated the footballer Kurt Zuma's pet cat because footage emerged of him kicking it across the kitchen for a laugh and filming it and putting it on Snapchat. They went That's and cool. confiscated that cat, but they officially approve as a method of slaughter for piglets who could be kept alive, but are just too sick to be profitable to take them by the hind legs and cave in their skulls against the pavement. This, this, is, this is obviously insanity, but what I wanted to say was that all of this stuff that I'm talking about is if the farmers are abiding by the law, right? These are all legally approved practices, except I, I think um, the, the, the tail docking and the, and the teeth, um, I think is illegal in the UK at least, but you know, farmers still do it. But, but that's, that's my point is that like, sans that, everything else I've talked about, everything is legal this is this is industry standard practice and yet every single time we send hidden cameras into factory farms we find that farmers are, are routinely breaking even the most sort of basic and ridiculous uh legal guidelines that are in place already so all of this this horror and and moral embarrassment is already occurring even if they're following the law and then factor in the fact that uh, fact, factor in the case or the consideration that in in a in a great many cases they're not and the problem gets only worse. There was a there was a farm in, I think it was Aberdeenshire. I'll I'll, I'll check that and make sure that that's correct because I can't remember which farm it was. Um, that recently it was a red tractor approved farm, which uh, was was discovered by sort of undercover investigators to be thumping piglets uh, to death by caving in their skulls against the the bars of the cages that their own mothers were being kept in. This kind of stuff is crazy. And so when people say to me kind of like, yeah, you know, I try to make sure my meat comes from a, from a good source. It's like, do you? Are we? Are we actually on board about this? Because when I ask people, what do you think about this kind of treatment of animals? They say, oh, that's horrible. That's terrible. It's like, well, let's make some noise about it then. Right? Let's stop buying factory farmed animal products. Let's engage in protests. Would, wouldn't the right way to encourage people to stop eating factory farm to give them alternatives rather than saying just stop? Like, wouldn't that be a better, even just sales, like sales of trying to stop factory farming. If I was going to market that idea, what I would do is, hey, hey, look at what's happening here. This is bad. But look at this farm and what they do. It's only a little bit more. You can order it from this place. It's only a little bit more. And you get to reduce this amount of suffering. And hey, it's carbon negative. Isn't that yeah. a better sell than like just stop? It's, it's definitely a better sell uh, in that I actually think that this is this is maybe what we're going to be, be, begin to see happening as veganism grows in popularity. The response there's likely going to be cropping up, at, at least when it becomes significantly um, economically viable, because there are enough people who are willing to sort of go vegan. You'll have companies cropping up saying like, hey, all of the problems that the vegans are raising about this horrible treatment that they tell you about in the footage they show you, here's our farm. We don't do any of that. We keep the calves with the mothers and we when they produce their milk, all this kind of stuff. And, and this is fine. And definitely, or as you say, that's definitely going to sell better than only eat plants. So it's definitely going to be more likely to convince people to stop eating meat. Um, and also it is genuinely, obviously, infinitely preferable to, to factory farming. Of course, when you start really engaging in animal ethics and 
sort of vegan activism and animal ethics I, I see as two totally different spheres. Vegan activism is about, as you say, what's going to get people to stop eating meat, what's going to sort of bring down factory farming, this kind of thing. Whereas animal ethics is like this interesting academic study into the, the nature of pain and, and what morally matters. Once you sort of engage in that for long enough, you realize that there are arguments to say that even if we're not factory farming, animals, there might be good reason not to be killing them unnecessarily. And so you might be committed ethically to the view that, you know, farms that uh, that aren't factory farms, that, that produce so-called sort of ethically produced meat, um, are still unethical. They're still, as long as you've got sort of plant-based alternatives available to you. Uh, but as I said earlier, that would become, that would become almost like more pedantic. It would be kind of like, yeah, like, because sort of taking the life of an animal without its consent is 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 wrong we should probably be eating plants instead but it wouldn't be this like huge obvious moral emergency that that factory farming is so yes i agree with you that it that it sells better but it's it's difficult for somebody who's ethically committed to the view that essentially exploiting animals is always wrong to advocate for that right people have often compared it to other ethical issues um you know talking about how they want no cages rather than bigger cages, this kind of thing. It's like if you advocate for incremental steps, you seem to sort of be legitimizing um, legitimizing the process. I mean, you, you can imagine imagine somebody talking about like abortion, imagine like a pro-life activist and there was some way to sort of make, you know, abortions slightly less painful for the for the fetuses or something you know presuming that the fetus is at a level where it can feel pain and we say we've developed this technology where as as they're being killed they they feel like 50 percent less pain or something like that but they're still in pain right and the pro-life will probably say no this is still horribly immoral and i said to them well but don't you recognize that this would be a better sell if you told somebody who was you know uh who wanted to have an abortion like hey, if you use this procedure, you know, the, the child's going to feel less pain, they're going to say yes, and they're going to be far more likely to say yes to that than they are to just bringing the baby to full term. I think the pro-lifer would still have a hard time sort of advocating for this technology, for the technology that sort of 50% reduces the pain involved in abortion or something like that. Do you see what I'm saying? Yeah. Like oh, it, yeah, it, for it, sure. It would, be, it, would be impo it would be impossible to do that. So for someone in my position who sort of does deeply care about animal suffering, um, more broadly than just factory farming, it, it's still troublesome to me, the idea of animals being bred and confined and killed. But it's it's way, way better than factory farming. So I, I'd celebrate a move from factory farming to more traditional forms of agriculture. Uh, but I still think that I would be in the camp of arguing that plant-based agriculture is the way to go, or at least uh, cultivated meat, which is the, the, the next big sort of exciting development in the in the conversation which is if we can produce sort of, you know, essentially biologically the same matter without causing any animal suffering, then the problem essentially just disappears. Yeah, well, if that's a possibility and it is just meat, but it's from a lab, then hooray. But I feel like so that's, that's the most like, economically that's, viable. Yeah, but it doesn't exist. Not N really. No. Yeah, I mean, you can you can probably buy like a lab grown burger for like half a million dollars or something at the moment because the technology is there. But this is how all technologies start. And, and so to answer your question, because it's a bit of a long winded answer and I don't want to be seen like I'm avoiding uh, the question. You said, well, isn't like sure, like advocating for veganism is is great and all to stop factory farming, but it wouldn't actually just be more effective to advocate for but it wouldn't just be it wouldn't it wouldn't just be more effective. It would also mitigate the risk that long-term veganism isn't healthy for people and that and it's it's not just that i think that i and yes, i do believe this i think if you'd gone back say uh, say to the 1940s this is just a theory here but i feel like if you've gone back to the 1940s and you put somebody on a vegan diet it's possible that they could do it properly to be healthy longer term like i'm willing to go that far i think the amount of chronic illness we have now and how sick the average person is like the um, percentage of people with autoimmunity, it's skyrocketed. That mental disorders, obesity, right? It, it's bad right now. I think the average person right now is sick. And that's why we're seeing such restrictive diets work for people. Like, I don't think mm. the carnivore diet, there, are, there were some anecdotes of people in like the 1910s on a carnivore diet. They went to visit um, Inuits and then they already ate like that. So set aside, I don't think 
you'd see so many people on a carnivore diet 60 or 70 years ago when people didn't have these chronic diseases. I don't think my diseases would like existed exactly back then. But I think if you're dealing with people now, uh, pushing for regenerative farming also mitigates the issue that we could potentially be pushing a diet that's going to increase chronic disease, which I think it might. And at least mm. I think we need more studies to prove that it doesn't. Yeah, I understand that concern. And I think uh, a lot of vegans would be quick to dismiss it with reference to, as I say, like dietetic associations saying that veganism is healthy. It's it's like we need to take this stuff very seriously. You know, scientific communities being like, being like, yeah, we've done some studies and it seems pretty safe to be doing this to our children. It's like we need to be we need to be really sure about this stuff. So so uh, although I'm, I'm I'm I guess I'm pretty optimistic about the idea of a, of a plant based diet being nutritionally adequate. I wouldn't want to dismiss those concerns and I, we would like to sort of amplify that I uh, care about them, too. Uh, but it, it, there's kind of a way of of avoiding both problems, which would be cultivated lab grown meat. This is like if there was one thing that we could sort of all focus on is what's actually in reality, probably going to have the biggest effect. It might be lab-grown meat because you still get the animal products that you want to eat. You you still avoid the sort of health concerns that you're talking about, but also you now don't actually have to kill any animals at all. And so even if we're sort of not sure what we think ethically about taking the lives of animals, if they've had a net positive existence, which I'm actually quite sympathetic to the view that if they genuinely have a net positive existence and that existence is parasitic on the idea that they will be killed eventually that might actually be good for the animal probably is good for the animal um regenerative farming maybe which depending on the farm interestingly isn't quite the same thing as saying that you have the right to kill them i mean it, it might be the case that it is actually better for the animal to bring them into existence and then kill them but as jeff mcmahon who was at the event in oxford pointed out in in a, a pretty wonderful essay on the eating of animal products even if it were the case that this animal wouldn't exist if we didn't plan to kill it and it was better for the animal to exist and then be killed once it exists it's still arguable that you don't have the right to take its life because now that it exists there's like a it's like an interest that you're upsetting by killing it it's a bit of a, a bit of a sort of sidetrack but what i was going to say is that lab grown meat might solve all this problem um and so I think that if we could sort of invest a lot more time and energy into lab-grown meat, we'd we'd be uh, we'd be on the right track. But as you say, it's quite a long way off. So we're sort of figuring out what to do in the meantime. But that's kind of how I see it, given the advent of this technology and how revolutionary it could be. For me, it's kind of a case of well, what do we do in the meantime? You know, for the next I don't know, a few decades or however long it's going to take, might take longer than that. Who knows? You know, how do we um, how do we manage ourselves and, until then? Uh, but I think that would probably be the best option. But I, I've said before um, in some podcast or interview or something that although I do think that because you were asking about sort of what's actually going to be the most effective method of getting people to change, something like that's going to be the answer. But I've said before that I do pity the people who will have to explain to their grandchildren, right, when, when they sort of their grandchildren are saying to them, you knew about factory farming. Yeah, you, you knew about the mistreatment of animals that was going on in there. You knew that there were healthy alternatives from plant-based agriculture and even, you know, regenerative agricultural alternatives that you may have had access to. They go, yeah, sure. And they say, so why, why were you still eating animal products? And you have to explain to them that until lab-grown meat came about, you know, you just, it just wasn't the same. You know, I just couldn't quite stomach that, that chickpea burger or something like that. Although I do think um, it is the case, in other words, in reality, that most people will in fact change their diets based on something like lab-grown meat rather than an ethical case, it's going to be a pretty awkward conversation when they have to explain that that's what it took because the ethical case wasn't enough for them. Unless it has health implications. Of course, yeah. <laughs> so for, so for, the, for those people would be um, the people who are, are eating animal products just because they taste nice, which... I would wager, uh, and I don't exactly have a statistic to back this up, but I, I would I would suspect that the majority of people who are eating animal products are eating them, uh, I, I want to say, how can I word this? The majority of instances in which somebody eats an animal product will be based on taste pleasure. Um, but maybe consider... because, maybe the reason people actually like the taste is because we've grown accustomed to it because it's healthy. Yeah, no, that, that would be no surprise to me. In fact, like that evolutionarily makes sense, right? Like it's it's the reason why certain things are pleasurable to us, you know, by and large is because they're actually beneficial to our survival. 
Um, but of course, like the, the whole process of ethics, like what is ethics? What is ethical progress? Well, it's sort of overcoming our naturalistic, animalistic impulses to act in accordance with what we think is right and moral rather than what our sort of sensory uh, uh, pleasure inputs tell us that we immediately want, you know? It's kind of what that, ethics is. It's overcoming that kind of thing. That's true. I do think that people fall into the mistake of ignoring what their body tells them is right, though, by listening to what their brain tells them is right. And I think that's that's yes. an issue that our society is seeing. And I think probably going back to what you feel is right is probably a good way to be ethical, kind of a hippie way to be ethical, maybe. And it doesn't necessarily <laughs> work like cocaine might feel good. It doesn't mean that it's ethical or it's going to be good for you. But you kind of know when you're doing that kind of thing, that it's not a good idea, right? And the mm. hedonistic stuff isn't a good idea. I don't know if you get that from, you might get that from KFC. That's yeah, like, so, that's so, not going to make anybody feel good. That's purely taste and that that's hedonism and there's nothing healthy about that. Exactly. That's just bad. That's and so when, when I talk about these people who will have to explain this to their grandchildren or people who are just eating based on taste pleasure and you come along and say, but what about all the people that are, that are doing this for really like, uh, for, for, for the sake of their health? Cause they need to, it's like, yeah, okay, I, I agree that that's a different story, but like I, I'm talking there to the people who are sort of going to KFC. You know, if, if you go into KFC and see the people sort of queuing up, and, and these are like some of the most popular producers of animal products, your McDonald's and your KFCs and this kind of thing. So I do think that it is a separate ethical question, or at least a, an adapted ethical question, when somebody is eating animal products because they genuinely need to. But of course, if they genuinely need to, then the definition of veganism accounts for this. But if you look at the majority of animal products that are being sold, if you walk into a McDonald's, and I was saying all of this kind of stuff, I walk into a McDonald's and say, you're all going to have to explain this to your grandchildren. You know that there's a vegan alternative just down the road. And now even in McDonald's, you can get a vegan alternative, but you won't do so. Um, I think that, that that point stands. But yes, I mean, the one thing that I wanted to emphasize, and, and again, why I thought it was important to talk to you and reach an audience like yours who, as you say, will disproportionately be at least knowledgeable about uh, health concerns as related to animal products and, and the necessity of eating meat and this kind of thing, is that, yeah, you know, I, I can't speak for vegans broadly, but certainly the ethical veganism that I promote is the kind that says that if you actually need animal products to be healthy, then not only can you break your veganism, but you can eat animal products and still call yourself a vegan. Although I wouldn't do it if I were you because it comes with a lot of social baggage. <laughs> okay, Alex, that was great. Um, I have to go, but I would like to have another conversation um, because yeah, you talk, do a, you do you a lot. Of, yeah, you can try to talk me out of Christianity. Talk you out of the, the God thing. That's, yeah, yeah. Uh, let's do that recently. Let's do that next. Okay. For sure. If people want to follow you online, where where should they go? Uh, well, my I don't think I even said earlier that my my online pseudonym is Cosmic Skeptic. As I said, I made this account when I was like sixteen. Um, so it's quite a unique name. So basically anywhere slash Cosmic Skeptic, Twitter, YouTube. YouTube's the main one. TikTok now also, regrettably, but I'm there too. So anything forward slash Cosmic Skeptic will take you there. Okay. Thank you again. That was fun. Of course. Cool.